started. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Andrew Carpenter. I'm the director of the National Center for Applied Transit Technology, and we are excited to talk about integrating micromobility and transit. And so uh, at NCAT, which is operated by the Community Transportation Association of America, uh, we focus on helping small urban, rural, and tribal transit agencies with understanding new and emerging transit technologies and the whole technology landscape, and then how to apply that to their transit agencies to um, achieve goals that you have set for yourselves. So the idea is to be very deliberate and thoughtful about new technology and how that can help you. So it's not technology for technology's sake, but it's really thinking through what tools you need to accomplish what you want to do. And so we do this through resources such as webinars like these. We also work on um, guidebooks and um, guidebooks, podcasts, and fact sheets. And so those are populated on our website, which is at the bottom of your screen, n-catt.org. We also provide in-depth technical assistance uh, through our state technology or through our innovative technology strike teams and our state technology summits. And the idea there is to really enable states and individual agencies to adopt new technologies and understand how to do so. We also develop hands-on workshops that um, transit agencies can use to upskill and focus on different tech concepts. So we just held one on uh, managing data, and then we are also developing one on um, geographic information services and um, free tools for using that. And so um, also NCAT is a technical assistance center funded by the Federal Transit Administration. We work in a network of other TA centers. And so um, one of the big themes of this is coordination among the TA centers and among uh, transit agencies and different community service organizations. So that way folks can get where they need to go. So the Transportation Technical Assistance Coordination Library, TACL, which is run by National RTAP, um, is focused on that coordination theme. And so you can go there for a lot of different information about that. And then finally, again, I'm Andrew, I'm the director, and Marcelo Moreno is our transit technologist. We're the, we're the main faces for NCAT. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us at any time uh, with any transit technology questions, and we'll be happy to answer them or look into them for you. And so our contact information will also be on the last slide once we're done. Uh, and then finally, before I hand it off to our speakers, um, we are doing a lot more on micromobility. So we're working on a guidebook. And so one of the items that we would like to cover is your experiences with micromobility. So that way we can know how to reach out to you or know what's going on so far and then meet everyone where they are in their experience. So I just sent the uh, SurveyMonkey link out in the chat to everyone. So please click on that and um, fill out that survey. It should only take about five minutes. And then that would be greatly helpful for us to develop our micromobility resources. And so overall, um, our goal with this webinar is to introduce everyone to the, to the fact that transit agencies and micromobility services can work together. They are not competition with each other. And there's a lot of good that can be done in, um, in collaborating between micromobility service and in um, transit. And so one of the leading examples of this is uh, the Kansas City area, KCATA, and Bike Walk KC. And so I'm going to hand it off to Eric and David to um, get started. Thanks, Andrew. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Right. So everybody can see my slideshow. Yes. Excited to be here with everybody today. I'm um, always happy to talk uh, micromobility and bikes. Uh, I'm Eric Vaughn with uh, Ride Casey Bike. I'm the director of the program um, and really started with the program as it 
got its launch in 2012, um, or immediately after the launch, I guess a few months after. Um, and then, uh, David, I want to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, David Johnson, Vice President of Planning and Strategy for the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. Uh, we're the regional bi-state uh, transportation authority for uh, in, on the Kansas and Missouri sides of the Kansas City Metro and uh, a proud sponsor of the Ride KC bike system uh, that Eric team, Eric's team op owns and operates. Uh, and we see it as a key integration point with our uh, transit network, uh, buses and streetcars uh, throughout the region. Happy to be with you today. So what we're gonna discuss today is a little bit of background, uh, sort of where we've come from, what model we've decided to deploy here, why that model is so important to what we do, um, looking at new technologies, because we're actually one of the very few cities who has completely changed over our technology and updated it um, from really an older, more traditional bike share model to something uh, that's a little bit better fit for our current community. And then of course, transit integration, I know everybody's anxious to talk about that, so we'll talk about the steps we've taken toward that, and also maybe some future plans that, that we're thinking about as well. So for the program history, I mentioned that we started in 2012. This is really early in bike share for America. Um, we were probably one of the first half dozen or so cities to launch bike share so extremely early in the game. And at that time, there was really only the dock-based technology where you had to physically take your bike and, and lock it into a dock at a physical station. Um, and so we started with that program in just the downtown core of Kansas City um, with just 12, 12 locations, I think around 100 bikes, um, and started it immediately as a public-private nonprofit partnership. So Bike Walk KC operating as the main nonprofit arm that was owning and operating in partnership with those other organizations in the community there to support. And what we really saw was, was really a warm welcome from a community that was not a traditional bike share community by any means. Uh, if you're not familiar with Kansas City, we're not, not dense, uh, especially outside of the, the immediate urban core of, of downtown. Um, and then uh, it's, we've got a lot of sprawl um, and, and really not a lot of infrastructure. Um, that, that's specific for uh, biking and pedestrians. Um, so it was a little bit of an uphill climb, but you can see here on some of the data, um, it, it really did start to take off. Um, and with the timeline here in 2015, when you start to really see momentum build, that's actually us expanding beyond that more dense urban core area and getting out into this role. So we're actually going to more rural, less dense, environments and, and being rewarded in ridership um, as a result of that. Um, and I'll note as well, as we go further down the line and, and the colors start to change, that's where we start to integrate additional technologies as well. So as we grew beyond the dense area of our cities um, and as we integrated technology that was new, um, we, we continued to see success. And there's a dashboard link there at the bottom uh, all of our, our uh, all of our data is publicly available there, year-over-year um, -year data, as well as ridership trends, in case anybody is actually interested in diving a little deeper. Um, and we knew immediately that, that the key was not necessarily density, as people had always told us. Um, it was more infrastructure. And so we started to focus more on uh, co-locating with infrastructure rather than density. Um, and that, that trend really took off for us um, first in, in the form of a location at a standalone park with some great trails, and then later um, moving into rural communities that have um, protected infrastructure as well as trails. So the model that we spoke about, the P3, that's the public private nonprofit model um, we're certainly not the first to replicate this model or, or, or have it in our communities, um, but I think we've done a really good job of perfecting it and making sure that everybody has a piece of the pie 
um, so that the community as a whole is making sure the goals are worked towards and everybody has an interest. Um, so here, Bike Walk KC operates as the umbrella organization that owns and operates um, the, the bikes for the community with Ride KC Bike really serving as just the operating program um, of Bike Walk KC. And then we have the Transit Authority, uh, various municipalities, uh, counties, uh, and, and cities, uh, private sponsors, and then Drop Mobility, which is our vendor for the bikes as well as our software platform. Um, so everything is housed as one turnkey service under Bike Walk KC, but running as a program of it through Ride KC Bike. Um, so why would we want to do P3? There are some other models out there. Um, you know, we, there's the private sector that can run this, this style of program. Um, and then there's also uh, the style where the government is really taking full control, um, owning and operating. And there are merits to all the models, but we really like to uh, stick with the P3 where you're getting everybody involved. Um, diversifying is really crucial. Um, you know, the old adage of don't put too many eggs in one basket, that's really important here in particular, making sure that we diversify our funding streams um, and making it as sustainable as possible for the future. But it also promotes increased ownership. And this is a very key component. Um, we wanna make sure that the municipalities, the private uh, funders that exist within our communities that everybody really has a piece of the program, um, which which helps to grow the the entire um, the entire experience. Um, it also helps with resource sharing. Um, every organization has key strengths and, and weaknesses, um, and this really allows us to make sure that um, we're we're maximizing what those are for how the partnerships are structured in our unique communities. Uh, David with KCATA is a great example. Um, them as a transit authority have very obvious uh, strengths that we can lean on that us as a small nonprofit organization wouldn't normally have at our disposal, if not for their interest in, in the program. Um, and so we try to take full utilization of that, as well as you know, lend our expertise specifically as an operator um, to those partners in the community as well. Yeah, and I'll just add to that by saying um, there are community, you know, we work with lots of different communities, about 10 at the moment, and they vary from cities to counties uh, with our service contracts. We're a regional provider without our own revenue source, so we have to contract for service. And, um, you know, Eric's team has gotten us uh, advanced conversations with communities that we don't currently serve and vice versa. So it's very symbiotic. Um, communities that are interested in transit are quite often also interested in bike share. Uh, and, you know, like Eric said, they've done a really good job of proving that you don't need density, which in a low density metro like Kansas City is super, super important. I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks, and it also affects transit, is this doesn't pay for itself. So, um, you know, you have to convince someone that an operating subsidy is uh, a good investment. And as, as part of that investment, um, you know, the, one of the really big upsides here is, is accountability um, and, and work towards those community goals. Um, one of the major downsides we see with some of the private sector um, vendors that are out there is that there isn't a lot of accountability or adherence to uh, constantly working towards those community goals specifically. And so um, through working with municipalities, the transit authority. Um, we're constantly making sure that as a mission-based organization, we're striving to meet those goals and make the program match uh, the community's specific needs. So I mentioned before, we started off with a, you know, a station-based technology um, and that was a really good form for us to start up with when we were just in the, the more dense part of the city. But quickly, as we expanded beyond that, we noticed some problems with that specific model, um, namely uh, the scalability and the business model was really difficult to work um, when you didn't have that density component. 
Um, so we did an RFI to talk with everybody that was in the industry. As um, many of you will remember around this 2018 time, there was a big change in the industry where there was a lot of new companies coming out with new technologies. And we wanted to make sure that we were on the cutting edge of what was coming next. Um, and namely in some of the new smart technologies that are out there where the technology is physically on the bikes um, instead of having the big stations with the docks. Um, and so as we dove into that, um, we, we ended up establishing a relationship with Drop Mobility out of that RFI process. So that in 2019, um, January of 2019, we rolled out a pilot program to basically roll um, these new electric smart bikes and uh, electric scooters um, out alongside our existing fleet and study them for a year just to watch and see what happened. Um, it gave us a lot of really great data um, that, that is very unique um, in that I believe we're still the only nonprofit public entity to have our own uh, scooter data. Um, but this new hybrid technology as well, with the smart technology, is still um, very new and on the rise. Um, we've seen it come into quite a few cities in the last two years. Um, Colorado Springs, New Orleans, Tulsa, um, Dayton, Ohio. Um, so some other rural communities that are out there um, already embracing this as well. And so who are the problems uh, I mentioned with the station technology, high capital cost, had a high maintenance cost, um, made it really difficult for sponsor asks when we're out there communicating with the private business community. Um, and beyond the density area of our city, it was really hard to put a station literally everywhere that somebody wanted to go. So that was part of our nexus of looking at the new technology on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have true free floating, privately run um, uh, micro mobility. Uh, these are a few photos of things that we've seen in our community and, and really continue to see on a, on a daily basis, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we saw the, uh, the uh, potential that this type of technology had and the flexibility that it gave people. Um, we wanted to really see how could we take these uh, these negatives that exist around the, this specific new technology and mitigate those so that we could use them for the betterment of our community. And so our approach was, let's put lock two technology on everything where you physically have to lock it to something like a bike rack or a geofenced hub, uh, build that parking user, ac uh, user accountability right into the system um, and you have to actually take a photo of your end trip showing it locked up properly. I promise you, if you don't do it right, our team will send you a, a warning because they're very diligent about checking every single photo. Um, we wanted to work directly with cities, transit authorities, and pr private property owners. This is really key, uh, making sure that we're not just dropping into a community and offering our service. Um, we've heard from the community time and time again that as a service, we need to be there as active participants and not just um, someone who wants to put our technology out on the streets. Um, and then we also really focused on equipment quality and safety. Um, you know, the private industry is really about focusing on cost cutting and making sure that the things are as, as cheap as they can be, for lack of a better term. And so we're really trying to bring more of a public um, transit model to it where things are uh, very, uh, you know, reliably safe um, and at the same standard that you would expect from any other public transit mode that you would be stepping on in your community. Um, so sourcing uh, technology that, that is a higher quality um, than what we're seeing in a lot of other markets out there right now. And so what were the results of this pilot program that we went through? Uh, really outstanding. Less than 1% of trips ended parked improperly. Um, on the private side, we're seeing that more in the 30 to 50% range of trips um, with the free floating model that is. 
Over a third of users surveyed said that they were using it in conjunction with the other Ride KC transit services, 64% um, ending directly near a transit stop. Uh, the, the big one that I'm really proud of here is the zero reported public incidents with any of our uh, electric bikes or scooters. Um, this is something that's been a particular sticking point for a lot of communities around the country, particularly as it pertains to scooters, less so with the e-bikes. Um, but we, we had a really great success rate with that um, and goes to show you that local proactive operations can make a big impact on how people actually utilize the service. Um, low cost, um, we're charging 15 cents uh, a minute uh, for our electric bikes is 10 cents a minute walk up rate for our classic pedal bikes. Um, and uh, the alternative options out there are running about 33 or 35 cents a minute. So less than half the cost. Um, and we also have a higher rate of, of deployment in equity neighborhoods. So that's the, for us, that's the six zip codes that make up uh, the lowest income uh, areas of our city. Um, so we were deploying at about a 20% rate of our fleet, total fleet, um, and the other uh, private vendors, I believe, were offering up to 10%, um, so considerably more for our equity neighborhoods through this program. Yeah, and it's important to note if there are equity requirements, and, and these were requirements as part of uh, Kansas City, Missouri's uh, pilot program, that that will reduce or increase the cost of the program, right? So um, oftentimes I think communities are um, not aware of the operational costs uh, and maybe wooed by, you know, scooter money <laughs> for lack of a better word, because a lot of those companies are venture capital backed. Um, but, you know, it's not sustainable uh, to uh, cover up that operational cost um, with uh, basically paying off cities uh, and communities to allow unfettered access to the public right of way um, for who knows what purpose. And so it's important that communities understand that that's, that's the prevailing business model uh, and that there's a version of that that is a, a sort of a more public model uh, that Eric has, has shown that uh, can do better uh, if that's what you want the outcome to be. If you just want the money, fine. But if you want to change outcomes and provide equitable coverage uh, with devices, then you need to be willing to accept that the operating costs will be, will be higher or that the model is different on the back end. And so to add what David was saying, at the end of 2019, we actually made the decision to discontinue scooters from the fleet. Um, they uh, were not as reported um, from their performance to one, they were uh, less economically sustainable than the electric bikes, the classic bikes in our system, um, which uh, was very interesting because the argument from the private sector has been that they're a money maker. Um, and we very much found the opposite of that. Um, and then uh, for the electric bikes, uh, we actually showed that they had a significantly higher rate of trends, ridership trends associated with transportation usage. Um, so specifically, we were not, everything we were finding with the scooters on that side was associated with more recreational ridership and less transportation. Um, so due to some of those factors, um, we decided to discontinue the scooters from our fleet. Um, and can continue on into the future with electric bikes and with classic bikes. Although electric bikes will certainly be the priority going forward. And that's not to say that we believe that scooters aren't an effective first last mile solution. Uh, it's just that they appear to be used, it, for the most part, used differently than a traditional bike share system or the bike share system as, as Eric's team has implemented. And so uh, if you're going to spend public dollars, um, do it on the one that gives you that the best outcome. And so uh, because there was a higher percentage of trips ending their transit stops, the trips are longer um, and just all those other factors, uh, it made sense to invest there. Now, obviously the private sector is continuing to invest 
uh, both Bird and Spin are still in Kansas City operating. Uh, they are paying fees to several communities now. They've expanded beyond Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I myself am a first last mile uh, use case because uh, I don't have a car. So I will often uh, use a scooter to get uh, to and from places in a hurry if one's available uh, and a bike is not or a bus is not or I can't make the trip on foot. So um, I don't want you to walk away thinking we're discounting scooters completely. Just realize that the business model uh, isn't really uh, transparent uh, at this point across the industry. And so, um, you know, if, if people come bearing gifts, just know that there uh, is a sustainability question there. Right. And I'll add that we do still have some of our scooters um, in anticipation that maybe another community, local community will step forward someday um, and want them uh, for a specific purpose. But um, for now, that we're mostly hearing demand for uh, electric bikes. And so for transit integration, uh, you know, we've made a big effort to make sure that um, we are participating with transit in every way that we can. Ride KC Bike um, is branded that way specifically as part of the Ride KC Transit family, if you will, um, where every mode here is Ride KC, bus, streetcar, bike. Uh, so it makes it really nice from the end user standpoint to identify their mode. And you can find all the modes in the transit app um, where we're fully integrated so that if you wanna find a bike, you can do it in there, find all your other modes and do route planning. Um, and then once you actually find the bike that you want, it will automatically upload the bike in the Ride KC Bike app um, so that you're ready to go and, and get wherever you need right away. Yeah, and I'm happy to report that uh, as of this month, Every single service on this screen will be integrated into the transit app, with the exception of Ride KC Freedom, which are, is our paratransit service, which of course is not sort of general public access. You have to be eligible for that service, but we're thinking about it and working on it. So, um, and the Ride KC brand is designed to be just a brand. What you won't see with these logoed uh, services is that you don't know the operator or owner behind that service. And that's intentional because at the end of the day, you need to get to where you're going. So Ride KC Bus has four distinct operators, uh, but the vehicles and services are integrated, right? So uh, Ride KC Max has one. That's a convenient example uh, where it's not complex. Uh, streetcar, one operator. Bike, one operator. Microtransit, two, soon to be three. So um, and again, Transit App has been a really great partner. They are what I call integration first, uh, as is Drop, the um, a technology provider for bike share now, meaning they want to make sure their app and platform is ready for integration from the beginning, rather than having to be coerced and paid to do it well after the fact and begrudgingly submitting, you know, uh, some sort of uh, API. Um, but uh, we've now been telling partners that we expect integration from the beginning rather than having to pay for it later. And that's of particular interest to transit agencies who should not be saddled with all of this like science class stuff where we have to become API and, and tech, technology integration experts because the industry refuses to do it on their own. Basically, if every agency says integration first, the market will start to respond and every vendor you work with will now sort of get the message. We haven't been giving that message and we need to. And uh, alongside technology integration, um, we've also co-located a lot of uh, equipment um, at specific transit hubs, um, helping to make them micro mobilities or mobility centers. Um, and then, uh, a few corridors as well. Um, Prospect Max Corridor, we've co-located co locations to provide first and last mile transportation for folks there. Um, but we're also seeing more and more um, ability for trail systems to move people around Kansas City. Um, we have the Mill Creek Trail System out in Johnson County that connects uh, several communities and we've seen it be quite effective 
um, where it's actually moving people, you know, from northern Johnson County all the way to southern Johnson County um, without ever ever having to get off of the trail, just doing it all via bike. Um, and uh, the same in Kansas City, we have the trolley track trail, a former rail trail that corridor that links several neighborhoods. Um, we're seeing people utilize these trails for both recreation and transportation. And so ridership remains really high on these types of infrastructure um, because you're getting sort of that double dip of benefit um, from two forms of ridership utilizing that infrastructure. And trails are something that exists uh, a lot in rural communities and sometimes can be underutilized. But um, recently we've seen some real success cases with that. And I think uh, looking forward, uh, there are a couple other trails around the Kansas City area that, you know, we've been in talks with the local community as well as the KCATA to get some bikes out there as well um, and, and support both transportation and recreation benefit in those areas. Uh, I think here in the next couple of years, we're going to continue to see that trend. Um, and we're also talking with some other really small communities out in um, the state of Kansas uh, about some further expansion as well. So um, as I mentioned before, we've seen the success beyond the, the traditional trend, uh, bike share community. Um, and I think the model can be replicated elsewhere as long as there is the, the correct model employed and also um, uh, co-located with that just right infrastructure that, that you probably have already. Um, and so here's my, uh, my contact information. I know there'll be questions at the end, but if anybody wants to email me as well, feel free. Um, and uh, if you haven't tried an e-bike before, um, I look forward to see you out riding soon, hopefully. Awesome, thank you both. And uh, so while Lissa gets her um, presentation queued up, this is, a uh, great transition when, uh, from your mentioning of the trails, uh, which will be very relevant in this case and um, how this works in small communities. And a point I failed to make earlier, but which um, is especially critical in this context is, you know, there's a lot of focus on the technology on the bike, but it's important to remember that the vehicle and the bike itself is technology. And so um, bikes are the most efficient machines uh, that have been made so far. So, um, so it's worth remembering that as uh, you think about, um, you know, propulsion uh, systems and whatnot, your, your feet are great ones as well. So uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Lissa. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lissa Regier, and I'm the president and CEO of Thrive Allen County. And we are a uh, small nonprofit located in Southeast Kansas. Uh, we were established in 2007 when a group of volunteers got together and said we are tired of seeing the brain drain and the decline in our small rural community. And we have since grown from 2007 uh, to a staff of 18 today. We focus on health, wellness, recreation, education, and economic development. So truly the whole health of a community um, and quality of life for rural communities. And our vision is that Allen County, which is a population of 12,500 spread over 505 square miles, uh, will be the healthiest rural county in Kansas. I like to call that my job security uh, because we have a long ways to go. Um, just for context, um, Allen County, we like to say that we are truly rural. We are two hours from any metropolitan area, whether that's two hours north to Kansas City, two hours east of Wichita, um, so excuse us, south of, of Kansas City. Um, we really are that like typical rural model of a very small community that really has to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Um, our region in Southeast Kansas is the poorest area of the state. It has the worst health outcomes. So we have a lot of barriers that we are working to overcome. And one of the things we truly understand about our small communities is that small towns will not survive unless people want to live there. It's so obvious, but what we really have to do in our communities is really ask that question. What do people want 
in order to move to our community or stay in our community. And so what we do at Thrive is we hold community conversations in every single town in our county. We do this every year, uh, a community a month. And we ask our community members, what are your dreams for your town and for our county? What are the barriers that you're facing? What would you like to see? How can we work with you? And through these conversations, one of the things that very early on in, in the inception of these conversations that, that bubbled to the top was we need safe places to walk and bike because there tends to be this misperception about rural communities that well, you're in a small community, so it's easy to walk and it's easy to bike, um, but it's actually the exact opposite. We just don't have the infrastructure. We don't have sidewalks in a lot of cases. We definitely don't have bike lanes and we don't even at times uh, have the, the lighting that we need at night to safely uh, walk. Uh, I know this because I experience this every evening when I walk with my sister in the evenings. Um, so one of those uh, ways that we decided at Thrive that we would start working to create these uh, more accessible areas and safe areas for our community to be out in was through trails. And so in the past decade, Thrive has worked with our community to create more than 40 miles of trails and routes. We, we like to call ourselves the king of trails uh, in Allen County. Uh, and uh, we're very, very proud of this. Um, the Lehigh Portland trails you see here uh, are, are kind of our gem. Um, and, and I could go into a lot of detail, but I won't. What I will tell you is through these trails, we really started to create a bike culture in Allen County. And because we created a bike culture, we were able to recruit a bike store that was in the Kansas City area to open in Iola, which is the county seat of Allen County and our largest town in Allen County. And when that bike store opened, we decided we wanted to make sure that we could um, really uh, work off of them in our community and in multiple ways. One, um try and promote them and get more people to purchase bikes from them but to utilize them because we wanted more people out on the trails and so for years at thrive we had been looking to our urban brothers and sisters uh around us with the bike share models that they had um and and we loved what we saw but we knew our community could not support that uh as i said we are a poor community um and so what we decided to go with after getting prices on what it would cost to get a system where you'd use a credit card uh, to check bikes in and out. It was completely not feasible for our community to do that. And so we said, we will work basically off of a lending library model. And so for our first bike share, what we did is we bought five bikes from the bike store. We bought the bike rack, we put up signage and we put them in front of our office, which is not what is pictured here, uh, but our office on the downtown Iola Square, which uh, we like to say is the largest square west of the Mississippi. So come check us out in Iola, Kansas. Uh, but so it's a very accessible area and Thrive is um, one of the very trusted organizations in our community where people come in to get care coordination. So if they need food assistance, utility assistance, uh, if they need help with health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. So we already had people coming into uh, our building constantly. Uh, and so we were that, that first point of access that was very easy for people to get to, to check out a bike. So when we first thought about this bike share model, we really thought what we wanted to do was bring people who were visiting family in town or visiting our community for the first time uh, a way to experience our trails and our community by bike instead of just driving around and so we thought this will be great for tourism we also thought oh this will be great to get people that bicycle grin uh, that feeling you get when you haven't been on a bike since you were a kid and all of a sudden it's like oh my god this is freedom and i love it uh, so those were our kind of expectations about how this um, this program would be used, the reality ended up being very different. And it really highlighted what we knew was a massive issue in our county, which was the lack of public transportation. Uh, what you see on the left side of your screen here, the first day we opened up our bike share, five bikes in front of our office, that's all we had. The three bikes on the left of this screen were checked out that day by a mom and her two children. This is the federally qualified health center. They took the bikes to get to a doctor's appointment. 
And what we saw over and over and over again was that these bikes were not used for tourism. They were not used for fun. They were used for necessity. They were used for people who needed to get to work. They were used for people who needed to go to the grocery store, uh, for people who needed to go to the doctor's offices, and believe it or not, for people who needed to go to the emergency room, which I'll go into in, in just a little bit. So this program really started to show us in, in more uh, just starker ways than we ever thought it could just what the need was in our community for these bikes. So over time, we were able to grow this program from those five bikes to more than 55 bikes that we currently have spread out across our county, across nine locations, and we continue to grow those. Um, we've really worked with the community to figure out the places where these bikes are needed. Um, we've, we've put them in very small towns. Savenberg is a town of about 68 people. Uh, they're a very large homeschooling community. Uh, their library is the focal point of that community. So they have bikes at that community and those bikes are used. Uh, the Marmoton Market, which you see kind of towards the right hand, uh, upper right hand part of the screen there, that is a local grocery store in a town of 500 that houses these bikes. So people can use the bikes to get groceries. Um, we have them at the community college, which is the largest user of the bike share program because they have international students who have no form of transportation once they get to our community. And so these bikes are a lifeline for them. Uh, we have them at local industries. We have two industries that asked for us to put our bike share uh, stations in front of their industries because their employees needed reliable transportation. Uh, so what we've done is really work with the businesses in our community, the entities, organizations in our community that we knew were trusted, that we knew could manage this program. So currently our bike share is spread out of, uh, over about a hundred square mile uh, area. We have some other locations we've, we already know we want them in. Um, and so we're currently working on that as well. Uh, our model is very simple. It truly uh, utilizes um, a lock and key system and a Google Doc. Uh, when I say that we are a bootstrap community, I mean it. We we do not have funding for transportation. We do not have funding to make really amazing, awesome projects. I am jealous of what they've got in Kansas City, but I am very proud of what we have here. Um, and and this is what works for us. And so this program for us has really been funded mainly through grants. Thrive is about 95% grant funded. Our current budget is about $2.6 million. Um, and so we uh, have been able to find a lot of grants to make this program work. Um, but some things I'd like to share with you, it doesn't just have to be grants. Um, it can take about, say, $5,000 for the first uh bike share, as we would call it, kind of a bike in a box, uh, bike share in a box uh, area to get set up with the five bikes and the racks and, and, and the equipment that you need for that. It can be less than that. It can be a lot less than that, depending on who you're working with. Uh, you can have donors, you can have industries fund you, or they'll sponsor you. Um, you can go through grants, you can go through uh, health insurance entities. There are all kinds of people who want to partner on these kinds of projects. And I'm gonna be really honest, I like to call this program sexy. Funders love this program. They love to talk with us about it. They love to see the data we can show them about our users and where people are taking the bikes. Um, and it's we've made it as simple as possible because the more onus we put on our uh, locations to check in and out the bikes, the less likely we are to get those locations to truly buy into our program. And so we know in our rural communities that we truly need to make this as easy as possible, streamline it, and just say, here it is, you can roll with it, no pun intended, but there it was, and and, and get it off and running. Um, second, bike share can save lives. And that picture I wish I told you to hold in your mind, uh, the bike in front of the ER, um, that was a picture that was taken when one of our um, regular bike share users, his name is Mark, he started to exhibit symptoms of a heart attack. And instead of calling the ambulance, as I say, you call the ambulance, please don't ever ride your bike to the ER if you think that you are having a heart attack. Um, but he truly knew he could not afford an ambulance. And so again, to show kind of the brokenness in our 
our uh, our system down here. He knew he couldn't afford it. And as his symptoms got worse, his niece kept begging him to go call the ambulance. And he finally said, I can't, you know, I can't, but I have the bike out front. I'll ride the bike to the ER, which again, my sister-in-law is a PA and she'd say, please, God, don't ever do that. Um, but he did. And he literally walked that bike into the ER and said, hi, I think I'm having a heart attack. And can you please call Thrive Allen County and let them know that their bike is here. Our bike share users love these bikes. They understand how necessary they are for transportation. I'd like to report that Mark is good. He was just fine uh, after they you know, worked on him and he is still a user of our bike share program to this day. In fact, I'll continue his story in a minute. But these bike share uh, bikes truly became our public transportation here in Allen County. Um, the other thing, and the guys mentioned this even in Kansas City area, uh, you've got to pivot to where your community needs you to be. Every community is different. Um, different models work in different communities. Uh, the way that the checkout works can be different. And we work with communities across Kansas and Nebraska, um, and in fact, across the nation to set up uh, rural bike share programs like this. And, and they all do it differently. And we say, this is what works for us, but that doesn't mean it's gonna be exactly what works for you. And we are big believers of pivoting and making sure that you are truly aligned with what your community needs. One of the biggest successes we've had this year is we were able to create, uh, in partnering with Allen County government, the first ever public transportation system uh, since probably the trolley in our area. And so now anyone in the community can call on demand and access public transportation between basically eight and 4.30. One of the things because Thrive was involved in this that we did was when we uh, ordered the bus, which you see in front of you uh, for the county to use, we made sure that on the back of it, and I'm sorry, you can't see it, but there is a bike rack on the back of this bus because we wanted to make sure that that loop was connected and closed, that you could be transported in this vehicle, but you could also take your bike with you to get further than where perhaps the, the bus could take you. And so we truly believe in that integration. And in a rural community, that integration looks very different than in an urban area, um, but it is still there. And we are very proud of that. Uh, I mentioned that we work across um, Kansas and Nebraska through a program uh, provided by United Health uh, Me United Methodist Health Ministry Fund, where we are able to actually roll out our bike share um, program in their communities for free to them. Um, and then we have worked uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas to, to do the same in programs that they provide uh, throughout Kansas. And then we've been mentors in Tennessee and Oklahoma and New York and other states to assist them in rolling out their uh, first bike share programs in their rural communities as well. And we're very proud of that because we know how valuable these bike share programs are. Um, and to kind of wrap up uh, Mark's story that I was telling you about, one of the things I'm so proud about that we instituted this year um, as our bike share fleet is getting older. So we started this in May of 2017 is when we uh, first started our bike share program. Um, and as our bikes are getting older, we want to cycle them out of our bike share system and bring on new bikes in their place. And as we're doing that, what we decided we would like to do is an earn a bike program. And so we offer for anyone in our community who would like to be put on a wait list that they can be put on this wait list and they go through a maintenance class with our bike and trails coordinator. And that bike and trails coordinator teaches them how to maintain a bike. And once they go through that class, they get that bike for free. And so that way we, we have so many long-term users of our bike share program. This truly allows them to own their own bike, which is for so many of our community members, it's just out of reach for them monetarily. And so they are so excited and they are so proud to have these bikes. And it is just one more way that we ensure that our community stays mobile and that they have multiple ways of getting where they need to go in our community. Um, and so that was in a very quick nutshell, uh, because I know that we're getting short on time, uh, Thrive's transportation uh, bike share program. Um, this is my information. I know it's very different than um, uh, what they're able to provide in Kansas City, but for any of you in uh, very small, very rural communities, I can guarantee you that this program has worked so well for us and the other communities that have been able to model it. And it has literally saved people's lives and, and I am so proud of it. And I thank you all for allowing me to share it with you today.
All right, thank you so much. And uh, so I'm going to put up all of our contact information so you can reach out to any one of us and uh, follow up with any other questions. And I think one, um, a bunch of questions have been coming in through the Q&A box. And um, I saw David and Eric were answering a few of them, but as an overall question for um, both Allen County and uh, Kansas City, is if someone is a let's say a transit agency wants to begin get uh, begin looking at um, micro mobility and how it might integrate into their system, where where and how do they start? And then vice versa, if it's um, a Thrive Allen County style uh, nonprofit operating bike share, how do they, what should they do to get started if there's transit in their area? You know, every uh, community is really unique and um, probably one of the best things to do is if you have the ability to, to do a bike share feasibility study, because not only will that tell you, um, you know, what's best for your community and actually outline a specific implementation plan and make recommendations on the model that's best for your community as well. So, that's something that would be an easy starting place if there's funding um, available. Um, other than that, um, we also at Bike Walk KC offer some, some resources as well um, around bike share planning um, for, for specifically for our community and, and share across the board um, with the national organization, uh, NABSA, North America Bike Share Association, um, who also has their own resources as well. And I'd say um, on the, the small, very small community nonprofit side, um, first, I'd like to say that Thrive is more than happy always. Um, we've been doing this for years to, to share everything we have on our bike share model. We share our Google Doc forms, we share our waivers, uh, we share everything. Um, no, our, our way of doing our bike share program is it's free. Uh, people bring in an ID, we scan it. Um, and they get the bike for 24 hours. Uh, once we get to know that they're uh, a good user, they can check it out longer. Most of our um, users are long-term users now where they check it out for days or a week at a time. Um, as long as we have a few that are able to be around for people who stop in uh, on occasion, but we just know that our community just really can't support paying. And so we get ours completely um, funded through grants. Um, but what I would say, um, I think in rural communities, you're pretty aware of what the transportation barriers and needs are and um, where people could really use that. I first would actually say one of the biggest things to look at is your workforce. Um, where are people struggling to get to work? Uh, are people struggling to get to the grocery store? Are people struggling to get to doctor's appointments? Those are the um, those are the organizations and the entities I would reach out to first and ask them, you know, do you have an idea of, of the need uh, of your consumers or your employees? Because they will. Um, and that will give you a really good place to start. Um, and, and then, yeah, and I really do recommend if you if you're looking for a bootstrap option, uh, we can reach out to us because we'll get you everything that we have. Um, we truly believe that it. If you don't have to reinvent the wheel, don't. Uh, nonprofits struggle enough as it is. Uh, so we just wanna make it as easy as possible because we know how helpful this program can be. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add to that is, you know, uh, the story of, of Bike Walk is, is, was born in advocacy and, and myself coming from advocacy, uh, you know, I really relate to that. Um, and I, I think find people who are passionate about biking, uh, and hopefully they'll be able to translate that into some other sort of broader community goal. Um, you know, uh, it, it's really interesting to see Kansas embrace a, a sort of recreational biking or sort of trails and things like that. Uh, and it's proving much like it does on the Missouri side that there is a there's a market for that. Uh, so find those people. Uh, who are passionate about biking in general uh, and see if you can tap that uh, into uh, grassroots support for a bike share system, uh, which as, as, as we've seen in Allen County could, could, could then graduate into real you know, transit that can uh, connect people to opportunities. I wanna add though, uh, you know, 
I think um, there is a business case for bike share to be made. Um, we provide a really valuable service and for the money invested for the people that we're moving, uh, you know, there is a high reward for that. Um, our, our fare box recovery rate, even though we're saying our price is extremely low, is still uh, higher than, you know, a lot of other things that we're subsidizing out there in the, in the community. And so I think, um, you know, when we're talking to leadership in our communities, I don't think we need to be apologetic about our service because um, we do bring high value uh, for the money that we're asking for, whether you're doing it on a, you know, basically free model uh, like Lissa or, or, you know, more on a public, traditional public transit business model like what we're doing. Um, I think uh, there is that element to it where we're bringing social entrepreneurship to it um, in a sense and also uh, a really valuable service to our community. Okay, awesome. Um, and so one, one more question and then Heidi, I'll, uh, in the Q&A, Heidi's asking for a GBFS. And so I'll look into uh, finding some links for you if you um, send me an email on that. And then um, other than that, one, one more question before we go, just because we're a little bit over time, is uh, the, one of the things that we focus on is being able to scale uh, different different options for folks and different technologies. And so we talked about how there are two different uh, models uh, that you both have approached, but um, uh, Eric and David, you've mentioned that you have spoken to a lot smaller places that are incorporating the Ride KC approach. Uh, and so how, how do you scale that down? And I think you touched on it about um, co-locating with infrastructure, but is, how do you, how do you um, kind of show that to other folks who are interested in scaling that. Down. Yeah, the, the main benefit to our new technology we've implemented in the smart bikes is that it's uh, significantly more scalable than our old model. Our old model, we were talking in 50 to $75,000 per location uh, as a starting point. Now we're talking about you know $2,000 per bike um, as a, as a scalable starting point. So, and that's for the electric smart bikes, not classic. Um, and so, um, that really enables us to put a lot more resources in a lot more places, um, and also scale to the specific size of the project easily so that it doesn't matter if you're a small community that wants just one hub for a very specific purpose, um, at that community center or on, uh, you know, a small community, uh, campus, um, that we can do that, uh, or we can, uh, scale it up and do more, uh, wherever you were community happens to have those natural connections that, that have the demand there for it. Um, so, uh, our top, one of our top performing hubs year in and year out, uh, continues to be at Longview Lake. Um, and it's completely by itself. There's nothing near it within 15 or 20 miles, um, yet it's continuing to get a lot of ridership. And it's because of, uh, you know, the use case of that single hub being near some really great infrastructure um, that happens to be popular with people. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter whether you're doing one location with 10 bikes or if you're doing uh, 10 hubs, uh, there's, a, there's a use case for them all. Yeah, and I would... It encourage people to stay flexible. I think that's the case for both, well, all of us really here uh, is, you know, if even if you have a, a business model, be open to other alternatives. I mean, Eric has uh, uh, agreements where they don't even own the bikes. <laughs> so, you know, and, and our Ride KC family has a variety, some services are contracted out, some are directly operated, uh, some are completely separately funded and governed. Uh, and so we try to maintain as much flexibility as possible. And um, that may seem hard if you're uh, you know, scraping around for resources, uh, but it, uh, it builds on itself. And when people know that you're flexible, uh, they may come to you with interesting ideas that may surprise you. 
Excellent. And then uh, for Lissa to go in the opposite direction, if you're scaling up, do you see a point where um, the system could get too big to be the library model and you might have to have to change it up and pivot as you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so we are at 55 bikes. That includes a couple of trikes, a couple of pedicabs. Um, we've really tried to diversify our fleet uh, to make sure that anyone in our community can be, um, can have access to it. Uh, and we had to bring on a bike and trails coordinator this year because it has grown so large. Um, and so we will continue to have to figure out how to grow with that and, and how to make that work. And again, being under grants is always a little scary because that grant disappears and then what's the next funding. And so part of what we're doing now is really building that case study. So um, if for some reason, one of those grants that we rely on um, consistently for this funding is to go away, that we've got industrial support, uh, local support that they would come in and also um, help uh, with that. Um, but yeah, I could see a time when that might not uh, be as feasible and we will continue to grow and pivot and, and to figure out what works best during that time. I mean, one of the things I love about what they do in KC is these are bikes that can be checked out without having to walk into um, an, uh, an organization, um, which means we could have them literally like out on the trails, which would be beautiful. Um, right now, we don't have that. Again, funding is always going to be an issue for us. Uh, but one of the nice things in a rural community is getting people to go inside those businesses and getting them to frequent those businesses. And so that's one of the things we're always working on, too, is how to bring the two um, together to benefit each other, that business and the bike share model and the user uh, as well. And I'll add that we, we actually have one uh, example of a bike library within our own system where we're working with a social service organization who deals with folks that are often unbanked and don't have a smartphone to access a bike. And so uh, they're actually stocking some on site and people come and physically check them out. So doing exactly what they're doing, um, just a little bit differently. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. And then thank you to our audience for joining us. And so, um, I'll make sure that I share or I save all of the um, questions in here, but it looks like we got to most of them. And so, uh, Tom, I will make sure we get back to you on that. And so, again, everyone feel free to reach out to us with any follow-up questions that you have. Um, we're happy to answer anything and then um, and to connect you to any resources that you need to get started. So, um, we're excited to begin getting bike share farther out into the transit world and get more people thinking about it. And so you'll see a lot more from NCAT on that. And then um, uh, we look forward to hearing everyone's questions on it. So thank you all again and have a lovely afternoon.